Jesus laid his life down and died to rescue us. Are you ready to lay your life on the line for him? reading is taken from Luke chapter 14 verses 25 to 35. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure heap. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear.
Lord Jesus, please give us your spirit so that we can hear and understand your word tonight. And don't leave us as we are, but change us. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus calls every one of us to follow him. What has your response been to that call so far? Some of us are still thinking through the implications of responding to that call. Some of us are reckoning that we've just started. Some of us have counted ourselves as followers of Jesus for quite some time. All of us need to ask ourselves tonight whether we've really understood what we're on about. We have to confront the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So my title is simply The Cost, and we're going to be looking at Luke 14, 25 to 35. Around the world, the pressures on believers only seem to be growing. Here are some examples of uh, news stories from the papers over just the last couple of weeks. Muslim converts to face the death penalty in Iran. Forced conversion action call from Pakistan Church. The Church of Pakistan has called for government action to halt the kidnapping and forced conversion of Christian girls. Outcry as U.S. bishop is deposed. Anti-Christian carnage spreads. The Bishop of Amritsar in the Church of North India has told how his family was forced to flee and feared for their lives as the persecution of Christians by Hindu extremists in the country continues. The cost of following Christ in this country at this stage in our history is not usually paid in blood, but it is real, and we have to face up to it. That's what Jesus is forcing us to do in this passage in Luke's Gospel. If you haven't yet done so, do please turn to that. Luke 14, 25 to 35, page 1048 in the Bibles that are around the pews. And I want to divide up this passage into three sections so that we can understand it clearly. And I have a heading for each section. So firstly, one face in the crowd. That's verse 25. Secondly, two sides of the same coin, verses 26 and 27. And thirdly, three parables to press the point home, verses 28 to 35. First of all, then, one face in the crowd. Verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said. And what Jesus says, we're going to come to in a minute, but the effect of what he says is to isolate every single individual in the crowd and bring them face to face with himself. And it's as if he says to each one, why are you here? What are you really after? Do you know where we are going? Can you handle it? Because he's not interested in crowds so much as in individuals. And he's speaking to each one. He's speaking to you. Why are you here? I don't know if you've ever experienced a match at St. James's Park. It is a while since I have been to St. James's Park. In fact, I think it was probably during Kevin's first spell as manager at uh, the club when the club was on a long upward trajectory. Yes, there was such a time. Admittedly, uh, it did not last, but it happened. And I remember the first time that I was in the thick of that ear-splitting roar of tens of thousands of voices when a home goal was Scored. Spine tingling. Times have changed. Jesus knows all about huge cheering crowds, and unlike me, he's not impressed. He knows how quickly the cheers turn to abuse. He knows that crowds can disperse as quickly as they gather. Back then, to my consternation, Vivian used to accuse me of being a fair weather fan of Newcastle United. Would I be as enthusiastic if they were falling like a stone down through the divisions? I can tell you now that she had a point. <laughs> I, 
I admit it. I am a fair weather fan. I think the only other time I had supported a team as seriously as I did support Newcastle then was when I took up Arsenal as they were on the point of winning the double right back in the early 70s. As Christ looks around at the sea of faces following him, he picks out you. And what does he see? Three weeks ago, we were learning from Jesus' parable of the sir and thinking about those with fair weather faith. What does Jesus see when he picks out your face in the crowd? Someone who's going to stick with him as he journeys towards Jerusalem and the cross, or someone who will decide that it's not quite as good as it used to be, not really worth it any longer, getting a bit demanding, a bit dangerous, time to ease to the back of the crowd, slide away unnoticed, a fair weather follower. But you can't go unnoticed by Jesus. He's watching because you matter to him. He cares. But he's looking for the real thing. He's looking for the ones who will never walk away, whatever the cost. So everyone who claims to follow Jesus undergoes a test of the reality of their discipleship. And that brings me to my second heading. So secondly, two sides of the same coin. And here in verses 26 and 27 are the terms of the test that Christ applies to our lives to see if we are for real. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me, cannot be my disciple. There are two sides of the same coin that is the cost of following Jesus. Verse 26 is one side of the coin and it really describes what a disciple must be ready to lay down. Family and life itself. In other words, not just sin, not just what we know to be shameful, though such things must most certainly be renounced and discarded from our lives, but the very best that life has to offer. Now, of course, Jesus doesn't mean literally that we should hate our families. He commands us to love our enemies. How much more should we love our families? What he means is this. When it comes to sorting out what comes first, the priority of Christ must be absolute. The disciple of Jesus has one Lord and only one. Parents, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, not one of these must be allowed to become a rival king in our lives, chipping away at the rule of Christ the King over us. If they do, that is idolatry. If they do, then we're on the road to spiritual disaster until they are dethroned and Jesus sets the course again. Now, that is not Jesus being tyrannical. A tyrant is an absolute ruler has no, who has no right to rule and who rules in his own self-interest. In other words, the opposite of Jesus. He is the only one who does have the right to rule, and he orders our lives not only with our best interests at heart, he also knows what is best for those we love. And he loves them far more than we love them ourselves. Disciples must be ready to lay down the very best they have, even life itself. And the irony is that everything we cling to, we end up losing. A woman died alone at the age of 71. The coroner's report was a tragic one. It said, cause of death, malnutrition. Before she died, she used to beg for food from her neighbors. What clothes she had came from the Salvation Army. Apparently, she was a penniless, pitiful, forgotten widow, but that was not the case. Those investigating her death discovered a huge stash of stocks and shares and cash. She was a millionaire, but she died of starvation because she would not part with anything, not even to feed herself. Jesus said, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me, will save it, Luke 9, 24. 
And that is the other side of the coin of the cost of discipleship. Verse 27 again, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. One side of the coin is what the disciple must be ready to lay down. The other side is what the disciple must be ready to take up, and that is his cross and the journey with Jesus following him. The disciple's cross is the cross of Jesus. That is to say, it is the sacrifice that love makes in obedience to the Father's will, even to death, when necessary. Helen Rosevere was a medical missionary in the Congo in the 1950s and 60s. There was a threat of civil war, but she didn't want to abandon those she was serving and who she had grown to love, so she stayed with them. The war started, and she, along with others, was caught up in it as a hostage for several months. Later, she described her captors, I quote, They were brutal and drunken. They cursed and swore. They struck and kicked. They used the butt end of rifles and rubber truncheons. We were roughly taken, thrown in prisons, humiliated, threatened. We were driven 40 miles north to be shot, but God intervened and we were driven home again. We were four weeks under house arrest, then under close guard in prison conditions. Then the group I was with was taken, but after traveling only 75 miles, we were put off at a house in the jungle. 19 defenseless women and children surrounded by some 75 men, soldiers and others, all filled with hatred and evil intentions towards us. Food was scarce, water almost unprocurable, danger was imminent, fear was in the very air we breathed, S wickedness surrounded us on all sides. It seemed inevitable that we should be killed. Now, in the end, they were rescued by mercenaries, and they lived to tell the tale. But what is even more remarkable than the suffering they went through was the response to it that Helen Rosevere discovered within herself. She says, in my heart was an amazing peace, a realization that I was being highly privileged to be identified with Christ in a new way, in the way of the cross. And she says, at such times of suffering, I recalled again all Jesus Christ had suffered for me on the cross of Calvary. Now it was my privilege to share his suffering for those I was trying to reach. He was made sin for me. How closely was I willing to be identified with him, with them? Was I prepared to face the cost? The motto of the mission organization that uh, she was serving was a saying of its founder, C.T. Studd, the same C.T. Studd that uh, Ian spoke about a couple of weeks ago. He had a privileged family background, and he gave up that. He gave up a small fortune, and he gave up his position as a star England test cricketer to go and preach the gospel in China first and then later in Africa. And the motto of their mission organization was this, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. And Helen Rosevere says, this was my firm belief. It was deeply burnt into my heart, and I prayed God that I might be found worthy. Is your firm belief that Jesus Christ is God and died for you? If it is, then do you also believe that no sacrifice can possibly be too great for you to make for him? And if you do, is that merely theory or is that daily lifestyle for you? Maybe we say to ourselves, I've laid that down and I've given this and I've taken that up and that is enough thus far and no further. I have reached the limit of the sacrifice that I am prepared to make. But if we have grasped the grace of Christ in such a limited way that we put a cap on our response, then Jesus says, you haven't really grasped it at all. You cannot be my disciple. Maybe though you don't say enough is enough, maybe your reaction to seeing the sacrifice demanded of the followers of Christ is different. Maybe you say to yourself, 
I know that it's true that no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. How can I deny that? But what Jesus asks is too much, not because he doesn't deserve it, but because I haven't got what it takes. I can't do it. It's too expensive. I can't afford it. It's beyond my means. I'm not up to it. I am weak and cowardly. I don't have it in me to be like Helen Rosevere. I'm just not up to it. What do these verses say in reaction to that? They say, do you want to be a disciple or not? A plea of incompetence, a plea of cowardice does not get us off the hook. And Jesus hammers the lesson in with three illustrations, and this brings us to our final heading. So thirdly, three parables to press the point home. The first parable is there in verses 28 to 30. The building of a tower. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Now this is not about a project like building some tower like Gray's Monument or something. What is the project for us? The project for us is living the self-sacrificial life of a disciple of Christ. Question, do you have the resources in yourself to finish what you've begun? Answer, no. We cannot do it ourselves. If we attempt to do so, we will fall flat on our faces. And the non-Christian world around us will rub its hands with glee and say, I knew it was just a silly phase that they're going through. There is nothing in it after all. And right enough, there is nothing in us that is going to keep us going. So we must draw on the limitless resources of the master life builder. He promises that he will give us everything we need to finish the job. Philippians 4.19, My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. The second parable is there in verses 31 to 33. The fighting of a war. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Question. Are you strong enough? Now that's a question that can be applied in two quite different directions. First of all, are you strong enough to resist the call of Christ to follow him? Answer, no. Once Jesus lays hold of your life, he cannot be resisted. You can't not follow him. That was the experience of C.S. Lewis, the author of the Narnia books when he was converted after years of atheism. He famously wrote in the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God, perhaps the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. You can't fight God. God is bigger than you. But then there's a second way of applying this question, are you strong enough? Do we have the strength to withstand the pressures that would crush the Christian faith and life out of us, that would crush the obedience out of us? Those forces are immense, and without extraordinary strength, we will not survive them. And again, the answer is no. We do not have that kind of strength, but Christ is our shield. We can advance behind his protecting power like infantry behind a tank. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And in Philippians 4, 13, the Apostle Paul says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. We are far too weak to go it alone, but he is invincibly strong. 
The third parable is there in verses 34 and 35, the useless salt. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure heap. It is thrown out. Question, when you claim to be a follower of Jesus, are you for real? An external show of Christianity is not going to last. You cannot pretend to be a disciple any more than mint choc chip ice cream can be passed off as granite. You might, for a while, persuade a short-sighted observer who you keep at a distance from the real you, but when the heat is on, you will melt away. When it comes to confronting the cost of discipleship, we cannot do it ourselves. We cannot fight God and win. And we cannot con our way into the kingdom. That's why Jesus concludes his teaching in the way that he does. The end of verse 35, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The true disciple is one whose ears have been opened by God to hear the call of Jesus in such a way that it simply cannot be dislodged. And for such a person, for all the struggles, no cost is too high. The Bible Society has a Bible bookshop in Gaza City. It used to be managed by a young Palestinian Christian named Rami Ayad. It catered for a Christian population of 3,000 in a city of 1.4 million Muslims. Just after Easter last year, a bomb was thrown into the bookshop. The shop front was shattered, the contents were wrecked, books littered the floor, torn and charred. As Rami and his faithful helpers bravely worked away inside the shop trying to restore some semblance of order so they could reopen for business, they heard the noise of a demonstration in the street and Full of anxiety, they looked out, and there they saw over 200 locals marching up and down outside the shop, young and old, mainly Muslim, protesting at what had been done to a Christian team they valued and had come to trust. And that was tremendously heartening for Rami, and shortly after, the bookshop reopened. A few months later, exactly a year tomorrow, as Rami was locking up his shop for the weekend, he was kidnapped and taken away. He was able to telephone his wife and assured her that he'd be back home soon. But the next day, on Sunday morning, his body was found covered in blood and with multiple stab wounds. He left behind a pregnant wife and two young children. A 24-year-old Christian named Issa, who came to pay his respects at Ayad's home, said this about him. He paid his life for his faith, for his dignity, and the dignity of the Bible and of Jesus Christ. Jesus laid his life down and died to rescue us. Are you ready to lay your life on the line for him? He probably won't call you to martyrdom. He is much more likely to ask from us mundane sacrifice day after day. But if Jesus Christ be God and died for us, then no sacrifice can be too great for us to make. For him. Let's bow our heads to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving everything for us. Thank you for calling us to follow you. Prevent us, Lord, from being merely fair-weather followers. Make us into the real thing. Amen.